book of Acts chapter 13 and verse 22. And when he had removed him, he raised up for them David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do my will. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. The pursuit of God prepares you for what God is planning. The pursuit of God prepares you for what God is planning to do through you. David was not chosen randomly. This was not a lottery ticket. David, the Bible says, was after God's heart. In other words, if you take your notes, write this down. God is after those who are after Him. Many times when people say, you know, how do I prepare myself to see God's activity, God's anointing, God's power in my life, you must understand, especially this as a, as a Christian, is this, is you and I are first disciples of Jesus before we are pastors for Jesus. We are followers of Jesus before we are leaders of Jesus. And Jesus is not really looking for leaders. He is looking for followers. Remember in the Bible, He never went around looking for leaders. In fact, all the leaders caused Him problems. He was looking for followers. Now, Jesus is looking to send out laborers. But not every leader is a laborer. And not every laborer is a leader. So what the Lord is after, He is after us being after Him. And that prepares us. The Bible says something about David. Now we don't know. Did he pray a lot? Did he fast a lot? Did he, did he, what did he do to cause him to be this man that God out of all the people? Now we all give testimony of God. A lot of us give a testimony. God saved me. God delivered me. He rescued me. But in this case, the Bible says God gave testimony of David. See, it's one thing to give a testimony of God. It's another thing when God gives a testimony of you. And what is the testimony that God gave of David? This wasn't, God, God can't say, David saved me. That doesn't matter. Uh, God's testimony is not going to be, David delivered me. God doesn't need deliverance. God doesn't need salvation. God, but what he said about David was incredible. And I believe this is the testimony God wants to have of you. David is a man after my heart. God didn't say about David that David had God's heart. And if you read Psalms, you know that sometimes he had, sometimes he didn't. He was after it. So what I want to encourage you with as a leader, whatever position that you occupy, especially those of us who are in ministry, and that is this, the pursuit after God prepares us for what God is planning. When you begin to pursue God, God will see you. Jesus tells us to do three things in secret. To pray, to fast, and to give. The true proof of pursuit, the true proof that we desire God is in our pursuit. We have to pursue. Jesus says this in, in author of Hebrews 11 chapter 6 and says this. He says, He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. In Matthew 6, three times Jesus says, in the secret pray, in the secret fast, in the secret give. And you would think Jesus' motivation for doing the secret things would be because it's the right thing to do. Jesus always attached a reward. And see, he said this, he will reward you, he will reward you, he will reward you. This may come off as a little bit kind of like um, even wrongly, but please hear my heart. Private discipline will yield public reward. What many times we want is someone's public reward. But we don't want their discipline. Everything you have right now in ministry is either a test or a reward. It's either a test or a reward. So I want to invite you, encourage you to be people like David. People that pursue Jesus. May it be a mark of your ministry. You are in love with Jesus. 
If you're not in love with Jesus and you're not pursuing Jesus, you will not carry the impartation to cause others to love Him more. And if you are super gifted, you will draw a crowd. You won't build an army. You will be sugar of the earth instead of salt of the earth. What sugar does causes people to want more sugar. What does salt do? Salt causes people to want water. We are the salt of the earth. That means people after encountering us should want Jesus, not us. But it cannot happen if we don't have a private relationship with God. Instead what we have is gifts, education, skills and ability to grow business, build teams, which is important. But in the kingdom of God, our number one priority is to draw people to Jesus. Can somebody say amen? So the first thing that I wanted to mention and that is this, the pursuit of God prepares you for what God is planning. The second thing that I want to highlight and that is this, Power is needed to meet the demands of service. Write this down. Power is needed to meet the demands of ministry. Power is needed to meet the demands of service. For Samuel chapter 16 verse 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. The next verse, it says the following. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. Now, this is God's diagnosis. The doctor's diagnosis would be, Saul, you're burned out, you need some meds, and you're not doing well, men, men, your mental health is not doing good. God's diagnosis was this, while Saul remained in the position of leadership, the power to do that position was absent. He was left with the position that now caused him biggest headache and caused him distress. Anxiety comes from three main things. Anxiety, distress comes from three main things. Number one, it comes from the demands of service. Number two, it comes from demise of sin. And number three, it comes from the device of Satan, the trap, the deception of Satan. The demands of service. The Bible says Jesus felt power leave him. It wasn't because he committed sin. Somebody touched him. When you serve, now we're not saying in any way that Jesus decreased in power or stopped being God. Absolutely not. What we are saying is that as human beings we have a limited amount of power and we can leak. And as you serve and serve you get depleted and what begins to happen is that you begin to feel anxiety, you begin to feel stress. And sometimes it's not because the position is very heavy, it's the strength is very low. As leaders, we can allow sin in our life and the Bible says this leader that God had named Samson, he had sin in his life and because of this sin, he had found himself in a situation where the Bible says the power left him. That means that when you begin to live a life of secret sin, sometimes the gifts of God, the Bible says they're irrevocable, meaning God doesn't take them away. But God's special sweet presence begins to withdraw and next thing that happens, we find ourselves unable to meet the demands of ministry that require power or demonic trap, demonic attack. Ministry has four main challenges. The first one is the pressure from our position. The position that we carry, senior pastor, lead pastor, um, youth pastor, whatever position you get in the church will carry pressure. Expectations that come from that pressure. Sometimes the responsibility carries pressure. Until you've been in the position where you're responsible for other people, you're responsible almost feels like for other people's happiness, <laughs> for other people's well-being because when everything is good, you don't get the credit. When everything is bad, everybody's hunting for your head. <laughs> you remember how it happened with David, you know, the whole city got burned. David, it wasn't David's fault and they all wanted to, guess who they wanted to kill? Not the Malachites, David. 
And that's how leadership is. Then the higher you go, the more pressure. If you own the company, you know there's a pressure that comes from being a CEO. Your employees, they pick up a check and go to sleep and you're worried. Where's the next contract that's gonna come from? Are we, are we gonna meet the, the deadlines for, for next year? What about the stuff? Is our insurance gonna cover if something is gonna happen? There is a pressure that comes with the position and it's just part of being in the place where you were entrusted with other people. Another thing the ministry provides is not only pressure, but the ministry provides pain from personal or interpersonal relationships with people. So if pressure was not enough, God will always has His precious children who have a way of getting under your skin. <laughs> Through misunderstanding, sometimes a personal conflict, sometimes it's flesh, and sometimes it's just challenges. He said, she said, I got hurt, this church didn't treat me right, oh th this is not the way I expected. People cause pain. Now we shouldn't be blaming them because we all cause God pain. Hurt people, hurt people. Yes. Wounded people, wound people. So ministry is not only has this pressure that has a position that comes from a position, and then you think that's not enough because you can have a position and not really interact with people. If you have any interaction with people, you're dealing with their insecurities, you're dealing with their hurts, you're dealing with their fears, unmet expectations, daddy issues, their demons. You're dealing with all sort of stuff. And typically, you will be the reason why certain things are not good in their life, you'll be blamed for it. And welcome to Ministry 101. <laughs> I wish I would tell you, hey, there's a secret how to avoid it. Absolutely not. Who killed Jesus? People in his closed circle. It's, it's just part of life. And they don't sometimes tell us that in seminary. But you go through ministry and you find out that, oh, oh my goodness. I'd rather work with computers. I'd rather work with, I'd rather be an AI or do, do some AI stuff. I, I, I do not want to, you know, um, Matthew Barnett said, if you want to be a bridge to a dying world, don't be surprised if you get walked upon. It, it's painful. It hurts to be rejected, be misunderstood, to be accused when people leave. And some people, when they leave church, they leave like demons, out loud, <laughs> very loud. They come in quietly and they leave extremely loud. They make a lot of noise and that, that hurts. That hurts. The, the third thing the ministry produces problems for ministry and that is a pushback from the devil. So you're like, man, people are hard. <laughs> you haven't had it running with the devil yet. Because when things come down with people, things get up with the devil. Demons begin to come against us. We're not, we're not doing a boys and girls club. We're not running some cookies uh, marathon or some kind of a fundraising uh, for raising cookies for, for, for something. We're, this is not charity. We're actually assaulting the gates of hell. The very identity of the church is Jesus said He will make the church be close to the gates of hell. Which means whatever we are doing, we're making the devil angry. And he's not going to be happy with it. Even if your church does not do deliverance, if your church exists, you're a threat to the devil. And he's going to cause certain opposition against you. And the last thing, this is all external, is you and I are flawed. And we have our own problems. We have home problems. We have financial problems. We have our own insecurities. We have our own things we're still dealing. None of us in here are perfect. So put all of these four things together is a perfect recipe for depression. Burnout? <clears throat> It's like, it's gonna happen. Put these four things, ingredients together and you have a perfect disaster. So those of you who are in ministry, some of you, you're like, how did you know? <laughs> I am in ministry too. <laughs> I didn't read this in the book. I just checked my uh, last two weeks of my schedule. <laughs> I find it interesting that every man of God that God called, He gave them power. Now I know why. <laughs> because the demands of ministry cannot be met without power. 
God does not lower the pressure, the pain, and the pushback. He just matches His power to meet the challenge. That's why without the Holy Spirit's relationship, shameless plug in, get the host the Holy Ghost, without a secret place, without relationship with the Holy Spirit, this is what typically will happen with us. We will cry out to God to make people nicer, make the devil nicer, make my responsibility, make my position not cause me so much stress. And what we end up doing is running away from the call of God, dropping the towel, but after a while, okay, how much can you drop? Because you got kids as well. That also carries certain pressure. You have a wife, you have a husband, that carries certain pain. To really avoid every pain in life, you have to get away from life. That's why the Bible doesn't say in Isaiah that those who wait upon the Lord, He removes their stress. It says He renews their strength. Because God understands with success comes stress. Just, it's just a natural thing. The moment you have more responsibility on your plate, you have more attacks. You have more pushback. And the Lord says, when you come into my presence, I'm not always going to relieve or alleviate all of that stuff. Now sometimes it's true, God just delivers us. Spirit of depression is gone, 100%. Sometimes 100%. We see a solution to this one problem, but come on. Two, two, two three weeks and somebody creates another problem. And so this idea, oh, I'm going to have a smooth sailing, that doesn't exist on this side of eternity. There is going to be frictions. There is going to be tension. And you're going to have to learn to manage it by making sure that your power matches the challenge. Not your power, His power. That's why God doesn't give David a degree. He gives him anointing. God gives David anointing. What crushes Saul was the power left. Position stayed, power left. He was still handsome, he was still tall, but no longer anointed. Your appointing requires God's anointing. A career doesn't require anointing. For a career you need degree, connections, gifts, skills, and, and ability to connect with people. Callings of God. Because they're not just dealing with people, you're dealing with spiritual powers and at the same time you're leading people. You're yourself struggling. You yourself have certain things, have certain areas of your life where maybe a loved one passes away. Certain areas of your life where old wounds resurface again and you're like, man, I, I don't have time to take care of me and I have to lead them. And so all we need to do all of that at the same time without losing ourselves is Jesus called him the Helper who helps us, the Holy Spirit. Amen? Is this helping anybody? Now, when it comes to this power that I was just mentioning, I'm going to divide this into two anointings. The inner anointing, and you have it in your notes, and the outer anointing. The inner anointing is in you, for you. It's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that lives in us. The Bible says you have this anointing and it teaches you all things. It produces the fruit of the Spirit. The outer anointing, it's what comes upon us for others. The inner anointing is for my walk. The outer anointing is for my work. The inner anointing teaches me, but the outer anointing helps me to teach others. The inner anointing can not be transferred. But the outer anointing can be transferred. Meaning my personal walk with the Lord, you can't, I can't come and lay hands and you can be disciplined. That's just not how that works. But gifts can be transferred through laying on of hands, not character. In other words, the inner anointing helps to cultivate the character of the Holy Spirit. The outer anointing helps us to have access to His power. Now, to cultivate the inner anointing, we must live our life with the Holy Spirit not being grieved. But to cultivate the outer anointing, we must live our life with the Holy Spirit not being quenched. 
So quench, the Bible says, that speaks more of like the not fanning the flame, like killing that flow, killing that, that fire. But grieving the Spirit means when we do things that personally hurt Him as a person and we quench the flow of the inner anointing, which means we bankrupt us, bankrupt us on the inside and we can still even flow with the outer anointing, kind of heal the sick, move in the words of knowledge, but sooner or later all of that will cave in, will cave in. The inner anointing steals you, the outer anointing stirs you. So when, you, when you're in the secret place with God, God's Holy Spirit, when He comes in a secret place, typically it makes you extremely still. Still is, is this thing that happens inside where every voice just dies down. There's this calmness. The Bible says, be still and know that I am God. It's in a place where we know Him. The same Holy Spirit, when He comes upon you during ministry, you get worked up. In fact, you can get rowdy. Zeal can kick in. When it, when it hit Saul, he ripped oxen, burned them and sent a very threatening message and said, whoever doesn't come with me and Samuel, that's exactly what's going to happen to your oxen. You're like, okay, what happened to the stillness? Because the outer anointing doesn't still you, it stirs you. Which explains why sometimes a calm person, a quiet person, an introverted person, not socially very advanced person, anointing hits them and they're unrecognizable. I'm a very introverted person. Um, I am not uh, a, like speaking, that stuff scares, scared me. Now I'm just a little bit more used to less scared. And so, but when the anointing comes in, it does not matter. Um, it doesn't matter who's there, what their name is, how much money they make, what they think about me. It just hits you and, and it just, just gives you that stirring. And so, and those are the two flows of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, let's just address a little bit more. We all have access to the power of the Holy Spirit, but it is activated by either a vis visitation or impartation. Now, and let me give you a few examples. So visitation from God or impartation from the man God uses, Joshua and Moses. God supernaturally encountered Moses, but Moses laid hands on Joshua and Joshua received impartation. Samuel and David, God supernaturally visited Samuel. Samuel, Samuel, when he was just a lad. But Samuel imparted something to David and Saul. God didn't visit them like that. God supernaturally most likely visited Elijah. We don't see his beginning. We don't know where he came from. Most likely he had a supernatural visitation from God, but Elisha didn't get that. We know where Elisha came from. We know where his family, we know what he was doing before and the way he received the anointing upon his life is by Elisha imparting that. We see Paul is on the way to Damascus and Jesus supernaturally encounters him. But then Ananias prays for him as well. He receives his sight. He gets baptized in water and in the spirit. But if you really look at Paul's life, the revelations about communion, he didn't get it from reading Peter's writings. He got it straight from God, but not Timothy. Timothy didn't get it straight from God. He got it from Paul, which means some of us, God will supernaturally encounter us and there will be a release of power. Those of us who didn't get that should never be discouraged because those God encounters, He expects to share that with others. Why? So we all develop dependence on each other in the body of Christ. And this idea, I don't need anybody, I just need God is not biblical. Your fingers do not say that about other parts of the body. Your lungs do not say that about their kidneys and your bones do not say that about joints. We all need each other. Amen. And so a lot of times what happens is, you know, we come, we have something, we walk with God and then God releases that impartation when somebody prays for us. And I am a fervent believer in developing a secret place with God, but I'm also a fervent believer in the doctrine of the laying on of the hands. Where Paul says to young Timothy, he says that you will not neglect the gift that is in you that was given to you. And he makes it specific clear 
through the laying on of the hands of the eldership by prophecy. And we have to embrace that as a church and we cannot reject that and simply say, no, I'm going to get everything only directly from God. Certain things we get through other people and it keeps us humble. And those of you who got it directly from God, you have, you have to be generous. It means you got to pray for other people and give that to other people. No, 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 not walk around and say, so a thousand dollars and I will pray in partition. That, that is not, that's a, that's a New Testament Simon Sorcerer stuff. He brought gold and says, hey, could you Peter now give me this impartation and stuff. So though I am a fervent believer in honoring God's anointing and blessing other people, I don't have a problem with that. But I think the moment we begin to charge and we begin to set this precedent, hey, uh, you know, I want to pray for you. I want to release the anointing. There's just going to be a thousand dollar a month fee. Yeah. Jesus made it very clear, go and preach the gospel, heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, freely you received. Amen. That means this by God is received freely. Anybody who charges you, run from them. Anybody who puts a price on it, run from them because they, they're contaminating and marketing something Jesus says in his temple that is not right. There's nothing wrong. I don't, I, I don't have a, an issue with uh, selling coffee or, or selling books. The moment it comes to the grace of God, the anointing of God, the power of God, the healing of God or deliverance of God, those things are never for sale because Jesus paid it with his blood and he gave it to us through grace. That means it's a gift. Amen. Amen. Now, you can have anointing upon your life, but if you don't do anything with it, it will lie dormant. Let me say that again. You can have anointing upon your life, they can come through impartation. Somebody, for example, and we're going to do that today. We want to pray for impartation, that people receive that. But you must understand, anointing is like muscle. Every, the strongest man in the world has the similar muscles to you. The difference between him and me is I don't exercise mine and they don't grow and I don't walk around buff. <laughs> I'm just a slim, well hoping to be slim, more slim. Amen. Anointing works through action and practice. When anointing came upon Saul, Samuel told Saul, when these signs get fulfilled, he said this, do what the occasion demands. If you don't do anything, it will lie dormant and you will think you don't have it. And it will grow with the fat of laziness. When in reality you have it, you just need to now act on it. How do you act on it? You, you pray for the sick. You tell somebody about Christian faith. You begin to cast out demons. You begin to step out by faith in the measure of the faith you have. Don't step in somebody else's faith and don't mimic somebody else. But in the measure of faith God gives you at the moment, begin to exercise it because impartation without activity lies dormant. And then we go to another impartation which says, man, give me another, pray for me pastor, pray for me leader, but you have already 20 impartations you haven't tapped into. You got to work it. Work it out what God works in. Give God an outlet for this anointing to work. When the anointing hit David, God sent him a bear. Now, I want you to notice this. David did not run from a bear. If he would have ran from bear, anointing wouldn't work. If he would have ran from a lion, anointing wouldn't work. And it's not because he didn't have it, it's that anointing works the way as God works it in, you work it out when God presents you a challenge bigger than you and gives you this spark of faith. Do what the occasion demands. What does that mean? That means sometimes God won't give you a specific word. He will give you an occasion and the anointing will kind of push you. And you just take the risk. 
Oh, but, but, but what does God want me to do? Well, measure with the scripture. God wants you to, to heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers. Freely you give, freely you receive. God wants people to be saved. God wants people to be discipled. God wants youth to be raised. God wants churches to be filled. So pretty much if it lines up with the scripture, you do what the occasion demands. Mm -hmm. David did not have a prophetic word about killing Goliath. Occasion demanded it. How did anointing work on his life? It worked when he kept acting when occasion demanded. You can receive the impartation and it can lie dormant for the rest of your life. That's why a lot of us don't need fresh impartation. We just need to not be lazy. That's why Paul said to Timothy, fan into flame the gift that is in you. Blow it. He pretty much says, you already got the spark. Keep on fanning into flame. Do not neglect the gift that is inside of you. What does all of that mean? That means that God never gives it to you in a full form. He gives it to you in an embryo and you got to keep on working at it. Keep on working with it. You will not operate in the same anointing that you received right away. But if you work with it, you walk with it, next thing that happens, you will begin to see similar results and greater works than the people that gave it to you. I've seen the same thing in my life where, you know, and I'm a junkie on this. So when a junkie, I, I don't mean it like in, that I'm use drugs. But I, especially in the early stages when the Holy Spirit became pers a person to me in a relationship with Him, I became so hungry. I had one big goal. I wanted to see people saved every single service in our church. That was pretty much all I wanted to live for and all I was willing to die for. And so me and my wife, we sowed a large seed. We, we didn't do it to get the anointing. We did it because we sensed the Lord leading us and it was really painful, which was a confirmation to me that it was the Lord leading me because I didn't want to do it. So that was another confirmation that the Lord was leading me. So, and when we did that, right after that, you know, we became radically, radically generous again. I don't believe in buying things. I'm totally against that, but I do believe my heart needed to kind of shift toward these things. And so we would have different ministers, you know, tr sometimes come around Tri-Cities and somebody who would have a breakthrough in their college in Idaho. And I would hear they get like 300 kids getting saved once a month. And, and I mean, we would go and I would grab a little seed, you know, whatever I had, sometimes, you know, $100 or something. And I would come in, I would say, hey, could you pray for me? And again, I don't buy it, but I believe this was my desperation to God. I wasn't, because if that pastor would see what I gave him, he probably would, would laugh at me, but it wasn't about him. And one time actually I had $10 for gas and then $100 for a seed and I mixed the gas in the seed and I gave him $10 instead of 100. And so, um, <laughs> my God saw my heart. <laughs> so, and, but honestly, not only I was desperate to get the impartation, I, we worked our tail off to do everything we can to get as many people into church, to tell as many people. About. I knew there's supernatural grace, but I know God adds super to my natural. If I don't have natural, He can't add super to anything. I have to work. I have to be active. Because this, I, I don't know, maybe I already have it, I don't need any more, and it's just gonna kick in when I, I need to just keep on pressing in and keep on pressing in. And then there's that click happened when kids start getting saved, one after another, one after another, one after another, and it just started to continue. Same thing with deliverance. I remember, you know, when other people would pray for that impartation of that deliverance, and I felt that I received it. One morning prayer, I came, and this lady, she would come every morning at five o'clock, and she came and she's like, I had a dream yesterday. And you know, it's typically, oh, you're gonna have a baby. And so, and she says, and I saw you holding a baby. And I was like, oh yeah, here we go. <laughs> but she said, you were the baby. I was like, okay, tell me more, this is different. <laughs> Interestingly, what she said is actually, she said, I saw you like a little junchi. And he said, that deliverance that we've seen a race to deliver, you're gonna start seeing. And this, is, this happened before junchi couldn't come. So and I was like, well, yeah, of course. I mean, yeah, we, we've already done a little deliverance. And then when Apostle Junchi couldn't come, and I remembered that dream and I was like, okay, now this is our moment to begin to step in. And now it's been about five something years and we've been operating in that ministry of deliverance, moving in that ministry of deliverance and the Lord's been using us for His glory. So, amen. Number three, 
Slow success grows character. Quick success grows your ego. David gets anointed at 15. He becomes a king over one tribe at 30. 15 years of persecution for one tribe. And at 37, so for seven and a half years, he becomes finally the king of all the tribes of Israel. So do the math. About 22 years after God gave a promise. This is what I've learned about the Lord. He promises a lot and promises fast. He trusts a little and trusts slow. Let this sink in. The Lord gave me a promise 13 years ago we're going to have a baby. Or 10 years ago. Just never told me when. <laughs> yeah. The promise that we're going to have this building when I was 16 that we're going to be seeing in a year and a half or two years. And I carry that and I'm 37. That's 21 years already. And I'm only, only beginning, hopefully, probably going to be seeing in the next few years. And this is what I've learned walking with the Lord for the little time that i walked with the Lord is. God is far more interested in our development than in our destination. He gives this promise to give us hope. But if you think for a moment that you're going to come out outside and you're going to see the fulfillment of the promise, most likely that's not going to happen. I know this is not encouraging. <laughs> But sometimes truth sets us free. <laughs> Don't be disappointed when God anoints you, but men do not appoint you. God anoints David and his father sends him back to the sheep. He's like, yeah, uh, the prophecy, that was good. Uh, that was very good, David. Uh, so now <laughs> go back <laughs> to where you came from. Kills Goliath. You would think Saul would give him a job at the palace. The Bible says, and David kept going back to the sheep. People didn't believe in him. Was he still anointed? Yes. People will always appoint you way, way later. Never be frustrated with them. It's on purpose. Because God wants to develop humility. God wants to develop that it's not about us. It's not about our title. And it's his timing. And it's serving him. If you're too big for the sheep, you're too small for the throne. The anointing should never cause our head to swell. Miracles and signs and wonders should never make us sick with pride. The moment we have inflated self-worth because we're anointed, criticism will destroy us. The best way to keep the criticism from ruining you completely, it will hurt, criticism hurts, don't get me wrong. But the best way to not to allow criticism to hurt you deeply is don't allow the good things God does through you inflate you. Be the same person that you were when you had nothing but love for Jesus. And that's what process does. Process, because when God gives a promise, our head goes, oh my gosh, I'm going to change the world. And God's like, yeah, there's a small little print that says, I'm going to destroy your world first. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to like totally crush you. You're going you're gonna to go from a grape to a wine, but do you know how the process, yeah, you're going to go, no, God, deliver me from that. I'm going to take an olive. You know how I'm going to make oil out of it? Uh, God, I don't want to know. Yeah, it's going to be through crushing. Yeah, I'm going to be an arrow in God's quiver. He's going to shoot me. Do you know that he actually pulls you back first before he releases you forward? And when you're going backward, you're like, God, you promised me I would go forward. Why are you taking me backwards? It doesn't make sense. I feel like you left me. That's exactly how all of us have to go through that. In this process, if you don't serve another man's vision, nobody will give you yours. David was serving the vision of his uh, dad, the vision of his king, Saul. When you honor the anointing in others, God will increase it in you. 
David, and this, this is a huge, during this process, it's very big, very big. When you notice the flaws of people that are leading you, when you notice the things that you could do better and you choose to be humble, and we're not saying in any way that we cover sins of people. What we're saying is that we don't allow our heart to develop into dishonor, rebellion, undermining, and despising. Dishonor does not, does not reveal much about them. It exposes you. When God says, honor your father and your mother, the honor of your father and your mother does not mean your parents are honorable. It means you're the one that's honoring. Honor exposes you, not them. So for those of us who walk around like, yeah, the reason why I dishonor them is because he's a jerk. No, it's actually you the one that's a jerk. <laughs> oh, he's just, he's just really bad. I can never honor. No, you might not respect them. Respect is earned. Honor is given. Honor is not the same. Hon David didn't respect Saul because he left him. When Saul starts throwing spears, David didn't hang out there and wait to be killed. I mean, come on, we have to have boundaries. We need to read book on boundaries. And David is like, I'm gonna leave. I'm not gonna stay in this toxic environment. But David never dishonored. Even when he distanced himself from this man. Is this helping anybody? When you're in this desert season, do not waste your wilderness. David built an army through that season. He got to know God. He wrote a lot of Psalms. The Bible says John the Baptist, when he was in the desert, he grew in spirit, waiting for his manifestation to Israel. He didn't just watch sitcom and movies and play video games. He did not get better in Mortal Kombat. He actually grew in spirit. Meaning his desert wasn't wasted, his wilderness wasn't wasted. If it feels like, man, I'm doing everything, it's not working, I'm just wasting my time. No, no, no. Grow. Train. Build yourself. Develop yourself. Amen? Amen. And the last thing that I want to share. Those who lack purpose will distract themselves with pleasure. I was at the mountain just about a few weeks ago. I, I tried to go semi-regularly. I used to go more regularly, but last year has been a lot more challenging. We've been doing more fasting and so less of getting out of town. So I had a chance to kind of go out of town and the Lord gave me this verse that's been kind of c conviction for me and just a good reminder. Acts chapter 13 verse 22 and then the other verse that I'm going to share with you. When he had removed him, he raised up for them David. I felt the Lord put on my heart, and this is just an impression. The Bible doesn't say that God raised a nation to give to David. The Bible says God raised David to give him to a nation. Which means people don't belong to you, you belong to them. This idea that this is my church, no, you are their pastor. I want you to see the wording. God raised him up for them. Never forget the reason for your promotion. Usually we who did the right stuff, we will say, yeah, because you know, God gave me a promise. Yeah, I, I went through the process. The reason why I'm promoted is because, well, you know, kind of anointed. <laughs> well, you know, kind of runs in my family. My dad is a pastor, my grandpa was a pastor, you know, I mean, I was married and when I was married I was a virgin, I lived pure. And we look at all these breadcrumbs that are very vital and very important. And we said, this is why the Lord has raised me up. That's not how God sees it. Because there's other people who did that plus more and they're sitting in jail for the cause of Christ right now. God raised you up for them. Not necessarily because of anything you did. Even those things you did were important and God is pleased with them if they please them. The moment we see our exaltation, our promotion, our breakthrough as something we did, then when the time will come to sacrifice it for our purpose, we'll hold on to our position and never trade it to save a nation like Esther had to.
because Marduka came to her and says, if you don't give up your promotion now for the sake of your purpose, you were not raised up because you're cute. You were raised up because there's a cause. And that just hit me, that God raised us up to deliver, to serve Him, to serve. I want you to see one more verse, and that is 36, verse 36. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep and was buried with his fathers and saw corruption. It's not about serving our generation by the will of God, but serving God in our generation by the will of God. I want to make a distinction. The reason why is because if your goal is to serve your generation, you will be met with a lot of disappointment. Why? Not many of us will be effective in serving our generation like someone else. For example, some of us will be effective in serving our generation on a massive scale. Some of us will serve our generation on a very limited scale. And when your vision for life is to serve your generation, the enemy will use that to either drive you crazy fast, you'll develop a pace your children cannot follow, that will bring unnecessary stress that's not even attached to your position, it's just attached to your ambitious ego. And this is what I found. The definition of our success is the cause of unnecessary stress. When my YouTube exploded and I was, you know, I'm a local pastor and we have staff, leaders, growing ministry, new systems need to be developed every time the church is growing, which is extremely uh, pretty stressful to kind of develop, get used to that and retrain things. And then I have this ministry that started as a website, vladimirsavchik.com, that I managed during my breakfast. They kind of, kind of went up kind of quickly. I didn't plan for that, didn't just COVID happened and, and stuff. And, and the next thing I know is I found myself with seven full-time employees and 12 contractors. So it exploded and way less stressful to lead my ministry than to lead the local church. So part of me felt like, man, why do I need to be, you know, maybe some, it's somebody else's job. I'd rather just do videos, preach, write books and go where I'm celebrated instead of coming every week to the same people who kind of like this conflict, that conflict, this person's gossiping, that person's complaining. And I was like, man, I don't have time for this daycare stuff. And I went to the mountains. This was about three years ago. And I said, Lord, uh, what do you want me to do? And my first thing is, I should do something that could reach as many people for Jesus because Jesus died for something. Jesus died for this. I need to live for this. And that was my fault. That was my problem. That kind of a thinking. And I remember the Lord challenged me and He said this. He says, I will not judge you in heaven based on how many people you reached. You see, your great-grandfather who was killed after he sat in jail will not be judged by how many people he reached because he didn't reach a lot. He says, I will judge you based on if you did what I called you to do. And he said, I called you to be a pastor at 16. I never changed my mind. I said, then what do I do with the YouTube? He says, that's your problem. <laughs> He says, just because I'm blessing you, you learn to manage the blessing or cut it off. So I took 12 months from travel and I said, okay, let me build systems in the ministry because it reaches people, a lot of people, and it helps people. And I don't want to give that up. But my measure of success is not if I'm reaching people. The measure of success, am I pleasing to Jesus right now? Because nothing is worse than succeeding at what doesn't matter. It's worse than failure. It's succeeding at something just doesn't matter. That's why the Bible says in Colossians 1.10, it says, walking worthy of the calling of God, fully pleasing Him. Now remember the Lord on that mountain said, He says, if my son's goal for life would have been to reach the world, he would have not died at 33. He said, how was he able to die on the cross and say, I finished the work you've given to me when the world wasn't reached? He did what I asked him to do. 
and I was pleased with him. And after that, I changed my perspective from running in a crazy pace. Let's just do more, more, why? Because we just need to reach more people too. And then we run over our families. We run over our own health. We run over our own things and all for the sake of the gospel. But in reality, what drives us is a seductive definition of success. I want you to see what God says to David. He says this, he says, David served God in his generation. That means my eyes are not on my generation, though I'm giving my life to that, is to serve God in my generation. To give everything I can to God in my generation. And if tomorrow the, the influence, the effectiveness, for some reason, it completely stops, it doesn't change my focal point. Serve God in my generation. And if I have to step away from the position in the spotlight somebody else needs to come in, it doesn't change. Serve God in my generation. If God chooses to put me on the back end of the desert, serve God in my generation. If I have to be like Hannah who through prayer and fasting served God in her generation, that's my serving God in my generation. Then your eyes do not become on goals, your eyes become on God. And it's not about how fast you can run, it's about the rhythm of revival. It's running in such a way where you don't lose your family, you don't lose your health, you don't compromise, you don't burn your team. Jesus never ran. Walked. That's one of the reasons I do not like running. <laughs> Plus the Bible says the wicked man runs when nobody chases him. So I got two scriptural reasons against running. Enoch walked with the Lord. I'm just gonna be walking. <laughs> Jesus did not use a running animal, a fast-paced animal. He used a donkey. They're slow animals. Jesus walked so slow, hurting people could touch him. He was never busy. He was always present. That's why I like to always say when people come, up, I know you're busy. I said, no, I'm present. I'm here with you right now. After I leave you, I'm going to be over there. Yeah, I'm, it seems like I'm constantly, but in reality, I want to be present in each environment that I'm in. When I was in Italy, I was in Italy. Ministered there and I was present. Finished preaching, st stood at that book um, table for as long as I could. Pretty much was, I think, last one to leave. Same thing happened yesterday. My legs were killing me. But they're just my legs. They'll get sleep and they'll be okay. And so, and why? Because I want to be present in each environment that I'm in. Serving God in my generation. Not perfect, but I want to be in pursuit of serving God in my generation. And last verse that I'm going to read, and that is um, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 47 and 48, which I'm not going to read that. You can read it on your own time. And that is when God says, when you arrive at the promised land, and He says, I don't, and you have everything. And God says, and you stop serving God in joy and gladness of heart. And he says this, you will serve your enemies in hunger, thirst, and nakedness. So I use that, I know this is bad. Maybe it's the legalism part of me that still is on, on life support. Um, <laughs> but anytime it gets hard for me, I use that verse to remind me. Being a slave to sin is worse. <laughs> Anytime it gets overwhelming and it feels like, man, it just seems like there's just so much things that need to be done, so much challenges, and, and, and I sense the grace of God, but it's just, man, you know how Samson said this? And I didn't like when Samson said this until I was in ministry for a while. Samson says, I just want to be like every other normal person. <laughs> Remember when he said to Delilah, he says, if you cut my hair, I will be like every person. I will be normal. Pretty much in other words, I'll be like everybody else. I'm tired of being in this thing. I just want to just be normal. So he chose the normal. Didn't read the small print though. <laughs> Lost his eyes. Hmm. The pressure of his calling was so big, he wanted to run from it and escape to normalcy. When you encounter God, there is no more normal for you. Yeah. Hallelujah. Please, embrace this, serving God, 
choose joy in the midst of it even if you don't feel joyful. Because God expects you to honor His Son, His Spirit, the promise of heaven, His indwelling Spirit, to live for Him, not with the grumpy, oh, it's just so hard, it's just so difficult, but to live with the joy, having that attitude of it is, it is a joy to serve the Lord. I, yeah, it has challenging moments, but God is good. I see people's lives changed, and it's a pleasure to give my life to the Lord in serving my generation.